from Galatians chapter 6, uh, verses 6 through 10, is the, the, the um, most, most of my messages sent around certain scriptures. Today's message happens to be um, uh, kind of a, a play of what our church is. We're harvest time. We're in the harvest season, of course, yeah. in the fall. And uh, today I want to talk about the law of the harvest. And um, um, it will give you a, a bigger understanding of, of God um, by listening to this. The best way to learn of God is to be in the household of God. And you'll be taught the things of God over a period of time. It's not something that you learn just in one uh, setting, but multiple times. And usually um, you, you can spend a whole lifetime studying God and you probably won't know everything about him until you get to eternity and get to ask him the, the, all the other questions you have, which won't be important when you see him face to face anyways. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll get into this evening's message. Gracious Father, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the church that we have. We thank you for the opportunities that we have to, to spread your word, to preach your word, to be uh, faithful stewards and servants of yours to South Warren now for more than 30 years. Bless this word as it goes forth. Settle our hearts and minds so that each person here would receive from heaven a divine download of what you would have for each person, Lord. Bless them with a the message from this epistle, this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Galatia and wrote to us. It's called the book of Galatians. And Lord, I just pray that we would each receive what you would have for us this evening in Jesus' name. And all the saints said, Amen. 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 This evening's message is called The Law of the Harvest. And it's kind of interesting because a couple of weeks ago I was on a retreat and we had discussed the spiritual implications of what's going on in America and all the things that are happening uh, with COVID and the, 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 the retreat center that I um, attended, Camp Barakel, they just closed down last year because of COVID. And, you know, they were wondering, well, is this God? Is this not God? And all the people that work at this retreat center are missionaries, so they don't get paid for being there. They actually pay to be there as missionaries. They have to raise support so that they can afford to live and, and be part of this, this, this place. And one of the uh, discussions we had, like I said, was the spiritual implications of where America's at and all the things going on in America. And, um, you know, is this of God? Is this not of God? And, you know, I think one of the things that, um, you know, we could all kind of uh, digress to is realize, you know, God sends wake-up calls to people. And everything that's going on in America, these are wake-up calls to every Christian. And the wake-up call to us as Christians is this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Um, that's Matthew 6.33. And it's so important for all of us to seek God first. And, I mean, it's kind of interesting because, you know, when all this stuff happens, we all wonder, well, where is God in this? Well, God's still on the throne. He hasn't left the throne. He's still in charge. He hasn't... Uh, um, uh, abdicated his position at all. But, you know, it's easy for us to think about um, all that's going on and what we're living for when we go through difficult times. But I have to comment on this. The Apostle John, not the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote the letter that we're going to talk about today. But the Apostle John remarked that <clears throat> the world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. That's mm -hmm. in 1 John 2, 17. So we know that the world is passing away. We know that the desires of this world are not going to last forever. But the person who does the will of God lives forever. And if you want eternal life, you better be plugged into God because, um, you know, it doesn't work any other way. I mean, you can hear all this nonsense that there's many ways to God and, you know, this religion offers that and that religion offers this. I don't offer religion at all. I offer a relationship with the one true God. Amen. Amen. And that's it. 
So this verse that I just gave you from 1 John 2, 17, this verse ought to be memorized and tattooed onto our souls because in reality, we think all these things in the world are so important. We want the, the latest fashions and the, the best house and the best car and the best everything of this world. When you leave this world, you're not taking any of it with you. Amen. Nothing, zero, nada. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. You're not going to take any of it. You could be the poorest guy with just two pennies in your pocket or the, the richest billionaire, and you're not taking your money with you. It doesn't work that way. So since the things of this world won't last forever, doesn't it make sense for us to live as though they will? Yes. I mean, we've got to find out what will last forever. I mean, really, what, what's going to last forever? And then build our lives around those things that will last forever. It's kind of interesting. I used to have a pastor friend of mine um, who used to say this to everybody all the time. He used to put his arm around you and say, Curtis, are you ready? And um, I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting because every time I seen him, it was the same thing. And if he seen somebody whose name was Bill, he'd put his hand around him and say, Bill, are you ready? And it's like, after a while, I kind of got old because I thought I was ready. I mean, you know, and this was his favorite verse, are you ready? And it was his way of reminding people that Jesus is coming back and we have to be ready to meet him when he does. I mean, most of us, I mean, think, well, you know, wow, you know, when is Jesus coming back? But, um, you know, I mean, we just don't know what a week or a day or whatever holds. I mean, look at just in this church history. I mean, you know, people live and then they're no longer living yeah. in this world. I mean, I think of one of the founding pastors of this church, um, Art Knapp, a, a, a very precious friend of mine. He came to church Sunday, about five years ago. And he went home, shoveled snow, sat down in his recliner, and took his last breath. I mean, it's, it seems strange. And this was a faithful man of God. And, and Art told me many times, he's like, I'm not going to retire. He worked at Macomb Community College as a computer professor. He had another job uh, um, in, in, in the private sector um, for a, a major corporation as a computer engineer. And he said, well, I'm never going to retire. And he was into his 70s. He said, because I can't do what I do for the kingdom of God. If I retire, I won't have the income. And if I only had Social Security and my pension to rely on, I won't have enough money to do what God wants me to do. And it's funny because after Art died, people started calling the church, well, Art paid our rent. Art helped us with this. Art did this. For... Art never told anybody anything he was doing. But he had that big heart that just blessed so many people and no one ever knew that. So my question tonight is, uh, whatever your name is, I mean, let me put my arm around you and ask you that question. Are you ready? You know, and when we think about life, life is short, life is uncertain. I mean, and as we've learned in, in just recent days, I mean, the, the shocking loss of, of Cheryl Branson. I mean, you go to sleep and she took her last breath in the middle of the night. Yes. Nobody expected that. Our precious Jan, I mean, she had what seemed to be the symptoms of stroke. She was celebrating her 55th wedding anniversary in Mackinac. Mm. Mackinac Island had what seemed to be a stroke, but they never could, even could confirm that. And so they left the island by emergency uh, medical assistance because of what appeared to be stroke-like symptoms. They took her to Michigan City uh, just on the other side, this side of the bridge, and they couldn't handle the case there, so then 
They airlifted her to Petoskey, Michigan to a trauma center that could handle her case. And then after she was stabilized, they drove her from Petoskey back down huh. here by ambulance. And when she got to the hospital here in Metro Detroit, she quickly declined day by day. After a couple of days, she ended up in intensive care. Hmm. And then a couple of days after that, she took her last breath and passed into eternity. So life is short, life is uncertain. We don't know what life holds, but we know this. All of us have a 100% chance of dying in this physical body. But the question is, where are you going to spend eternity? Because whether you get 50 years or <clears throat> even 100 years, your physical body someday is going to call it quits. And the question is, where are you going to spend reality and eternity forever and ever and ever you'll spend it someplace and there's really only two options i mean there's some religious people that say there's such a thing called purgatory but in my bible i can't find purgatory i've studied it from front to back and back to front and everything in between my bible says you either go to heaven or hell and so you get to choose whether you want the smoking section or the non-smoking section? <laughs> and you get to make that choice. And I mean, I mean, there's nothing more important upon our lives than realizing the eternal realities that at some point in time, you better be ready to meet the Lord Amen. because you don't know what's going to happen today, tomorrow, or a week from now, or a month from now, or a couple years from now. You don't know when, that, unless you hasten that day, I mean, you don't know when that appointment is with God. All of us have an appointment with God. Amen. Whether you believe in God, don't believe in God, whether you believe in Santa Claus or don't believe in Santa Claus, you will meet God face to face. And we all have an appointment with God. It's very clear in the scriptures. It's appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. And so our message this evening is talking about the law of the harvest. And our text this evening challenges us to think about the issue from the standpoint of sowing and reaping. I mean, to have a harvest, you have to sow, and then when you do have a harvest, you get to reap. And it reminds us that choices have consequences. The choices you make in life have consequences. And that God cannot be fooled. You can fool yourself, you can fool your mother, maybe even your father. You can fool your friends and family, you can fool a whole bunch of people. But you'll never, ever fool God. And even though we may fool ourselves, and we may think that we're fooling God, <laughs> God cannot be deceived. Amen. See, in the King James Version, this particular text very specifically tells us that God is not mocked. We can't mock God. Whatever we sow through our choices, <laughs> excuse me, Whatever we sow, I think they have drinks in this place. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Whatever we sow through our choices, the choices that we make, that we will also reap. See, what we sow, we reap. And in Galatians 6, verses 6 through 10, it contains seven principles that explain this law of the harvest that I want to talk about this evening. These seven principles point to the way of true spiritual growth, true spiritual prosperity, and it also explains the life that God blesses. People ask me this all the time, <clears throat> how come you're so blessed and I'm not? Well, I've prepared myself in such a way to receive God's blessings. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I don't think there's anything special to the way I live or what I do. I just try to do the best I can according to what God asks me to do. But before we begin this evening, I have to ask you two questions that I want you to think about tonight. 
The first one is this. If we're going to talk about the law of the harvest, reaping and sowing, I have to ask you, what have you been sowing? I mean, what seeds do you sow on a consistent basis? And then the other question is a spinoff of the first question. Are you happy with what you're reaping? Are you happy with what you get back? because the two are interconnected. And I want you to hold these two questions in your mind, because I'm gonna come back to these questions before I finish my message this evening, but first let's look together at the seven principles that make up the law of the harvest. The first principle is this. Whatever you, whenever, whenever you receive spiritual benefit, there you owe a spiritual debt. See, where you receive a spiritual blessing, you also have a spiritual price that you should pay. Amen. In Galatians 6, 6, it says, Anyone who receives instruction in the Word must share all good things with his instructor. Do you realize the Bible says that? Are you kidding? I didn't know that was in the Bible. But there's a... This is kind of a general statement of responsibility with a very wide application. See, all of us receive instruction in the Word from a variety of sources. You might receive instruction in the Word from a pastor, or maybe from Vacation Bible School, or when you were a kid, or maybe from a small group leader, or maybe you have a personal mentor who helps you in the things of God. Often we receive help from the radio and television because there's some good teachers on both the radio and television. And many of us are instructed in the Word by books that we read, by music that we listen to. This list also includes where I just came from a couple weeks ago, Camp Barakel. There's Christian camps, there's Christian colleges, there's Bible institutes, there's Seminaries. Some of those are cemeteries because that's all they do is produce dead people that don't have much spiritual life. But the point is not where you receive instruction. The point of this text is how you respond to the instruction that you receive. See, if you want to reap a harvest of blessing, then it says you must share all things with those who instruct you in the things of God, the things of the Lord. See, Christianity, as I explained a few months ago, is a two-way street. The Apostle Paul, he blessed people, and he was blessed in return. We owe a debt of love and gratitude to those who bless us. We owe a debt of encouragement and prayer to those who bless us. And often we show support in practical ways, you know, through our giving. See, if you receive the benefit, then you're obligated to let the teacher or minister know that. Tell them. Don't wait. Do it. Paul says we must do this. See, it's a sacred obligation. And I know several Bible teachers that I'm fond of. For example, one of my favorite Bible teachers is Dr. David Jeremiah. I mean, I benefited from him. I support his ministry. Uh, the Reverend Billy Graham was another one, although he's gone on to be with the Lord. His son, Franklin Graham, has taken the mantle of his father's ministry and is doing quite a stand-up job. And by the way, pray for Franklin Graham. Franklin Graham yesterday uh, was at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota and had heart surgery. And so he's in need of our prayers right now. But the point is this. If you've been helped by some ministry, don't just be a taker, mm -hmm. but be a giver as well. Amen. Sometimes people think, well, I'm just here to take. What can I get? That's not the way it works. See, you'll be greatly blessed by God when you are a blessing. And you'll also bless ministries and ministers who will be enriched when you have to loosen up your purse, purse strings and, and support those people who have blessed you. 
The second principle that I want to talk about this evening is this. You reap only what you sow. Amen. See, a lot of times people think, Woo, I can sow my wild oats and it's all good. No, it's not. I mean, it might be good for a moment. I mean, even the Bible says that sin is fun for a season, but it leads to death. I mean, so the text here, Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8 says this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. See, the one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will he reap his own destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will that one receive eternal life. See, these verses have become famous over the years, primarily because they're great evangelistic texts. And although it's not Paul's primary application, he is still thinking about the pathway of God's blessings for believers. And he uses the illustration of sowing and reaping to drive home his point. The explanation goes like this. Since you always reap whatever you sow, for example, generous giving, which is a kind of sowing, it results in generous blessings, a kind of reaping. The principle itself is really easy to understand. You reap what you sow. If you plant apple seeds, apple trees are what you get. If you plant pumpkin seeds in the spring, well, in October or September or somewhere in the fall, you harvest these big round orange pumpkins. Nothing different. If you plant pumpkin seeds, you harvest pumpkins. See, you can't plant carrots and expect corn. See, a lot of people, they sow other things and then they expect something else. It doesn't work that way. You can't plant wheat and expect rice to grow. See, you only reap exactly what you sow. Amen. You reap only what you sow. This is as true in the spiritual realm as it is in the physical realm. You know, picture a country estate with two large fields. One field is labeled flesh, and the other field is labeled spirit. And every day we have hundreds of choices to sow, either in one field or the other field. In fact, I think everything we do is either sowing to the flesh or sowing to the spirit. There's really no third alternative. You're either sowing to the flesh or you're sowing to the spirit. That's about it. See, every word we speak, every step we take, every chance conversation, even the tiniest decisions lead us in one direction or the other. Sowing to the flesh, sowing to the spirit. There is no third option. This includes what we read, how we dress, who we talk to, what we watch on television, what we listen to on the radio, what we surf on the internet. It touches our habits. It touches our leisure time. It touches our secret dreams. It touches the people that we choose to hang out with. It touches the video games and the electronic games you play. Wow, really? Yes, it does. It touches the places that we eat lunch and dinner, the places that we go on vacation, the way we treat our coworkers, the way we respond when we are mistreated. It affects our prayer life, it touches that. It affects the time that we spend in the Word. I just had lunch last week with a, a very dear friend of mine. And he told me, I don't understand why people don't read the Bible every day. And I said, well, I don't understand that either. And he said, you know what? He said, if you took 40 days and you read seven chapters a day. He said you could read the entire New Testament in 40 days. I find that amazing. I mean, we have time to chit chat on the phone and play on Facebook and social media. It would only take about 30 minutes a day to read the entire New Testament in 40 days. We waste that much time 
on nonsense every day. Amen. But this affects our prayer life, the time in the Word, our giving to the Lord's work, our willingness to help other people, the way we discipline our children, the way we respond to correction, our willingness to share Christ with other people. And that's just a short list. I could go on and on. See, life is a series of choices every single day. And every choice we make is sowing into our flesh or it's sowing a seed into our spirit field. We each have two fields, our flesh and our spirit. We sow to the flesh when we pander to the flesh, when we indulge our fantasies, when we give in to anger, when we show bitterness, when we lose our temper, when we give in to gluttony, when we shirk our duties, when we know that these are things we should be doing, when we lie about our actions, when we dabble in pornography and then excuse it as it's no big deal, it's just meaningless images, when we lower our standards and when we compromise our convictions. In short, when we do any of the works of the flesh that Paul mentions in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, which we previously talked about in this series, <clears throat> that's sowing to the flesh. But then the contrast to that is sowing to the Spirit. It means living in the Spirit so that we constantly practice the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? We talked about that. It's Galatians chapter 5 as well, verses 22, 23 or so, right around there. But when we practice love and joy, peace, forgiveness, patience under pressure, gentleness to those who irritate the devil out of us. <laughs> and we show goodness to those who have need. I mean, that's what God wants us to do, is to be kind and be gentle with those people that irritate us. To be good to those who are needy. See, it's living under divine control so that the fruit of the Spirit dominates our thoughts, dominates our words, and dominates our actions. That's the point of this whole message, but don't miss the key point. You can't sow to the flesh all day long and then complain when you reap a harvest of corruption and sin in your life. That's right. See, what did you expect if you only sow to the flesh? Do you really think that you would be angry or bitter and grouchy and irritable and bossy and rude and quick-tempered and basically a grade-A jerk? <laughs> See, if you only sow to the flesh, that's what you are. And then you cancel all that out by saying that quick little prayer asking for God's blessing. Let me tell you, it doesn't work that way. Amen. You can't continually sow to the flesh and expect the blessings of God. Whatever you sow is what you reap. And you only reap what you sow Amen. every single day. Amen. So, Make sure you're sowing your seeds in the right field. And if you want to reap a harvest of God's blessings, you better know where you're sowing and what you're sowing. The third principle that I want to talk about this evening is you reap far more than what you sow. Amen. See, the point is closely tied to the preceding one. An acorn is just this little tiny little shell but it contains within itself that towering oak tree. A pumpkin seed is just a small little tiny seed compared to the massive pumpkins that it produces. Matter of fact, somebody on my Facebook about a month ago showed me this 2,200 pound pumpkin. Oh. Huge! And it all came from the same little tiny seed. So even the smallest carrot is many times larger than that small, tiny carrot seed. See, the size of the seed does not determine the size of the harvest. Mm -hmm. That's why our text warns on the, on the negative side. Do not be deceived. 
See, it's so easy to deceive ourselves. You cannot escape the consequences for your actions. See, you might think you can escape the consequences for your actions. Well, God didn't shoot me dead, and I got away with it. God doesn't have a zapper charged today. It must be on the plug. And, you know, maybe tomorrow I'll get out a zapper. But today I didn't get zapped. I got away with it. Phew! I got lucky and blessed. I got a pass on my sin. No, it says, do not be deceived. I mean, you cannot escape the consequences for what you do. Amen. Sin always carries a high price tag. Amen. You can't ignore God and then laugh in his face. See, when you think you're getting away with sin, God has four little words for you. You know what those words are? Judgment day is coming. Uh, uh, Judgment day is coming. See, you might not be judged instantaneously. You know, and when you sow to the wind, but you reap a whirlwind, I mean, one way or the other. See, some people think that if no one knows, they've escaped. Phew. I got away with it. Nobody ever will know. Wait a minute. If it's in the past, is it really forgotten forever? Or if they try to make up by, let's say, maybe I should do a few little good deeds. You know, I know what I did was really bad, but you know, I'm going to bless somebody today. I'll just do a couple good things. That'll even out the score. Or Maybe I'll just try to be a little more religious. You know, I'll wake up tomorrow morning and I'll start praying. And then I think I can avoid some of the punishment. You know, it doesn't work so. It doesn't work that way. See, the text tells us that God is not mocked. Sin always leaves a mark in us and on us. Amen. See, you can't shoot an arrow into the sky and repent while it's still in the air. See, because that won't stop the arrow from hitting something. Repentance pardons your sin, but repentance does not cancel the consequences. I've heard this one time before. I think it bears repeating. You sow a thought, you reap an action. You sow an action, and you reap a habit. You sow a habit, and you reap a character. And you sow a character, you reap a destiny. Mm -hmm. See, what's your destiny? But there's good news here as well. It's not all down news. See, the devil plays off, pays off everything in compound interest. See, because when you sin, it'll cost you more, keep you, and take you farther than you ever imagined. The consequences are always there. Whether they're instant or not, doesn't matter. But God also pays off in compound interest. And God's rewards far outweigh the pleasures of sin that we experience for a season. See, if we keep on sowing to the Spirit, we will always reap a harvest of godly character. We will always reap a harvest of answered prayer. We will always reap a life in harmony with God. And we will reap the many blessings that come only to those who please the Lord with their character and their lifestyle. See, the chorus of a beloved gospel song says it very well. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. See, no one will ever regret serving the Lord. Amen. You will never, ever, 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 ever regret serving the Lord. There are rich rewards in this life and unimagined glory in the life to come. Amen. You know, just uh, just yesterday I was looking at the funeral arrangements uh, for our beloved Jan. I was on their website. The funeral director said, you know, that when the family is going to hold her memorial service, it will be posted online. So last night I went to their website and looked at her obituary and, you know, I wrote a few lines. 
you know, how Jan was like the mom to everyone. She wasn't shy in giving us advice. She wasn't shy in telling us what to do. But she also cared. And most people knew that, even though sometimes she came across as being a little bit harsh. But, you know, I can only, um, only begin to fathom the unimagined glory that she now experiences in the presence of God himself. She's talked about that many times. Many people who are Christians talk about that. You know, I just can't wait to see the Lord. My fourth principle tonight is this. Reaping a godly harvest requires patience and persistence. Look at Galatians 6, 9. It says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. You know, a lot of times, nowadays, we just have people that are a bunch of quitters. You know, they get a little frustrated. I'm out of here. You know, why should I bother? You know, but anyone who's ever farmed for a living knows exactly what this verse means. See, my grandfather was a farmer. I was engrafted as a farmer at a young age. You know, you don't plant today and harvest tomorrow. You plant today, and then you have to cultivate it. Then you have to water it. Then you have to fertilize it. Then you have to till it. you got to pull weeds and take care of it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And then comes the harvest. See, it's one thing to plant, plant a few tomatoes in your backyard, but it's something else to plant hundreds or thousands of acres. See, full-time farming is not part-time work, it's full-time work. You start early and you work late, 52 weeks a year. My grandfather used to wake us up at 4 in the morning and his first thing out of his mouth was, let's go, you can't sleep all day. It's 4 a.m., we got hogs to feed and barns to clean. See, there's no end to the jobs to be done on a farm, even in the wintertime. You have to work on your equipment and maintain it to make sure it's up to par for the upcoming planting season. See, you don't get a harvest by accident. Farmers never get a harvest by accident. And you don't treat it as a hobby. See, if you want a harvest and you're a farmer, you've got to work. And when you feel like giving up, you have to work some more. This... Uh, so just recently I ran across this quotation from Calvin Coolidge, or one of our former presidents, on the importance of persistence over the long haul. This is what Calvin Coolidge said, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with great talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence, determination are alone omnipotent. And this is especially true in the spiritual realm. See, we live in a fallen world and we deal constantly with broken and fallen people. It's easy to grow weary and say, heck, what's the use? You know, why should I help that bum? Why should I help her? You know, she's fallen into the same trap 15 times. See, Sometimes we just need a little reality check. Amen. Life is hard. Deal with it. People are jerks. You love them anyways. Yeah. Things don't go as planned. You keep moving forward. People forget to say thank you, but help them anyways. People are hard-headed, but share Christ with them anyways. I remember... Um, my, my wife and I, we went to a family reunion a few years back, and uh, it, was in, it was in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and this little kid was just being obnoxious and, you know, uh, just out of control. And so my wife finally told him, you're unruly and you're hard-headed. So this little boy said, really? So he walked up to my wife, he bowed his head, and he said, well, feel it and see. Hard-headed. You know, I mean, some of us don't even realize how hard-headed we really are. But see, not all of your prayers get answered when you want them to. Right. Keep praying. 
God doesn't do what you think he should do. You trust him anyways. See, you might be scared and filled with fear. You just keep believing. Your friends and your family might criticize you. Do right anyways. Amen. Do you feel like quitting? It's always too soon to quit. See, let us keep on sowing. Even if our sowing means that we're sowing through our tears. Even if our sowing means we're sowing with a weary heart. Because in the end, we will rejoice when the harvest finally comes in. That's exactly what this verse tells us. We will reap a harvest. You see, I could give you a football illustration now. Let's talk about those tank, oh, lions, rather. Oh boy! Nah, we won't talk about that. Let me give you a let me give you a better football illustration. See, the Chicago Bears. The greatest running back in NFL history was Walter Payton. He was a African American gentleman. Do you realize Walter Payton was only five foot ten and he only weighed two hundred and two pounds? But he was an all the all time NFL running back to this day. See, Payton set the all time rushing record of sixteen thousand seven hundred and twenty six yards during his twelve year career. He carried the football over nine miles. That's how many yards. Equal 16,726. Excuse me. I don't mean to be rude. Um, but, but, but Walter Payton, he carried the football over nine miles in his career. If you divide that number by the time, the times that he ran the ball, you'd, have, you'd find out an amazing statistic. He was knocked down to the ground every 4.4 yards of those nine miles that he ran. Every 4.4 yards, he was nailed by guys bigger than himself. But he set the record because every time somebody knocked him down, he got up and ran the ball again. He kept getting up and getting up and getting up, even though through his 16,726 yards, every 4.4 yards, he got nailed. He kept on getting up. That's probably one of the most overlooked secrets of greatness. You continue to get up and you continue to run. When you're knocked down by discouragement, don't stay down. Get up and get back in the game. Amen. Why? For the glory of God. Amen. See, great victories await those who have great endurance. That's right. Walter Payton was one of them. That's right. But here's all that God asks of each of us. Do you realize that God commands each of us to not give up, to not stop, to not grow weary, and to keep on going. See, if you do those things, there will be a wonderful harvest to come. Amen. The harvest will partly come in this life, but much of the harvest will come when we finally get to heaven. And who knows? Perhaps we'll look down from heaven and find out that we changed somebody's life simply because we said to somebody else, are you ready? The fifth principle that I want to talk about this evening is this. We must seize the opportunity before it disappears. See, one passage comes to a very pr practical end with this word of application. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the household of believers or the household of faith. That's Galatians 6.10. The word opportunity actually comes from the Greek word, which means kairos, which is translated time. However, it's not a word that means the passing of the hours one by one. It refers to the moments in life where the door of opportunity opens before us and we have a choice to make. Will we go through that door when life opens the door or, we, or will we hesitate until that door closes. See, some people, the door opens, people look at it, wonder what happened, the door closes, nothing happens. See, we all have opportunities to do good. If we'll take them when they come, 
Every day there's moments when we can say a word of encouragement. There's times when we can get involved in solving somebody else's problem. If only we took the time to help them. See, we will have the time or, you know, maybe we don't have the personal schedule, but everybody has opportunities to listen and help. You might be eating lunch with a coworker and they open up about the fears of COVID or the future or some other thing. See, there's all kinds of opportunities every single day for each of us. This is a Kairos moment for the Church of Jesus Christ, if we'll only take it. But no door stays open forever. Opportunities come and go. A sculptor once showed his studio to a friend who spotted a very strange statue in his sculpting studio. It was a figure of a man with hair completely covering his face, and the man had wings on each foot. And the guest said, well, what's the name of your statue? He said, the sculptor replied, this statue is named Opportunity. Why is his face hidden? He said, because men seldom know when he comes to them. And he said, why are there wings on his feet? He said, because soon he's gone, and when he departs, he cannot be overtaken. See, so many opportunities to serve the Lord, but most of us miss them. There's all kinds of opportunities. Sending gospel books to other places where there are no gospel books. Helping at the church, restoring fallen people, praying for prisoners, visiting the sick, visiting the dying, teaching in the inner city, leading Bible clubs, sharing Christ with other people, giving meals to people who are hungry, counseling people who are confused, saving people that their marriage or relationships are failing, giving money to somebody who has a legitimate need, helping somebody through their addiction. The list is endless because the needs of people are endless. The sixth principle is this. We owe a debt to the whole world. Another famous African-American is Dr. George Washington Carver. He said it this way. How far will you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassion, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant with the weak and strong, because some day in life, you will have been all of these. See, our calling is to do good to all people. We owe a debt to the whole world. We owe a debt to the Jew and the Gentile, to the Muslim, to the Hindu, to the Buddhist, to the young, to the old, to the rich, to the poor, to the country dweller and the city dweller, to those who live in South Warren, to the happy and to the sad, to the high and to the low, to those who please us and to those who greatly displease us to those we like and to those we can't stand. Paul said in Romans 1.15, I am a debtor to all men. See, because of God's grace to us, we owe something to everyone, whether you're African, Asian, South American, European, Arab Jew, or any other nationality or any other ethnic group on earth, a debt is owed. That debt is to show kindness to everyone and to do good whenever we can, wherever we can, however we can do it. And the greatest good we can do is to share the news to the world. What is that news? The gospel of Jesus Christ. It's kind of interesting because our greatest need and every person's greatest need is Jesus. People need Jesus. They need to hear the good news that God loves them so much that he sent his son to earth Amen. to die personally wow. for them. Yeah. They need to know that through the death of Christ, their sins can be forgiven, and they can have eternal life as an absolutely pure and free gift from Jesus Christ. So let us do the greatest good and share Christ wherever and whenever we can with anyone who is willing to listen. And while we're at it, Let's do any other good that we can do as well. The last principle, and this is principle number seven, is start with the needs closest to you. See, Paul's final instruction in this, test, in this text is this. 
You know, we're under a special obligation to show kindness to those who are part of the family of God. It's kind of interesting because our faith joins us to Christians everywhere. We have a sacred responsibility to do good to Christians. That certainly applies to the local church that you attend, but it reaches out to other churches in our community, to Christian ministries of all kinds, and to missionaries in distant lands who proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere. And on a more personal basis, it means having a godly concern for fellow believers in your own family, on your own block, in your own church, and in the places where you work or go to school. But there's another way to say this. If we want to sow good seed, there's simply one simple way to do it. Start with where you are. So you don't have to worry, well, you know, when I get rich, I'll start blessing people. You know, when I get more learned in the scriptures, I'll start sharing the gospel. No, start with where you are. Start with the needs of those that are around you. Start with people that you know and people that you meet and see every single day. Open your eyes to the wider horizons. Pray for God to give you open doors. Pray the Jabez prayer. Ask God to give you more so that you can do more for the Lord. That's the point of having more. The point of having more is to do more, not for yourself, but for God. Look to your left, look to your right, look in front of you, look behind you, open your eyes, and you'll see the needs on every hand. You can't meet all the needs, but you can do something, and you need to do something if you're truly a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. And by the way, while you're thinking about your Christian giving, make sure you give to other Christian ministries. Support your local church but also support other Christian ministries. See, if we don't support the Lord's work, who's going to support the Lord's work? Amen. See, most people think, well, why should I bother? Somebody else will take care of that. People think that in the local church. Let somebody else pay the light bill. Let somebody else pay for the insurance. Let somebody else cover the expenses. No, that's your responsibility. All of us have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to support kingdom work, period. We cannot expect unbelievers to give to Christian enterprises and missionaries and churches. So we have to do it because God expects us to do it and commands us to do it. But if we don't do it, how does the work of God go forward? Christian people must support Christian work or else they wither and die. And that's that's what's happening with a lot of churches now. See, no church ever died by giving too much. Mm. But many churches died by giving too little. It's impossible to be over generous when you're thinking about the work of God. We ought to give and then give again and then keep on giving. Why? Because you give to God. You're sowing to the Spirit. And from that Spirit, you will reap a vast harvest in this life, and for all eternity. You know, I know some people will say, well, you know, you know, these Christians, you know, they just want me to be a, 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 a do-gooder, you know? I mean, wait a minute. Yeah, you should be a do-gooder. I recall in Acts 10.38, where the Apostle Peter summarized the ministry of Jesus by saying this. He went around doing good. Why should we do anything less? You can look it up for yourself. Jesus went around doing good and he expects us to do the same. Amen. So, I think if somebody calls me a Christian do-gooder, that's a nice compliment. Mm-hmm. It's not a slap. Right. The world would be a better place if we had more Christian do-gooders. Amen. Amen. I'd much rather be a do-gooder than a do-batter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or a do-nothing. For that matter, I'd rather be a do-gooder than a do-nothing-at-all person. But don't complain that the world is dark. God requires you to light a candle. Is it not Jesus who said, 
let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That's Matthew 5.16. The good deeds that we perform, when we do them in Jesus' name, shine a light into the darkness and point other people to God. It's kind of interesting because I wonder how many of us would say, you know, I'm just sick of living a mediocre life. I'm sick of coasting. I'm sick of living half-hearted. I'm sick of having no real purpose. You know, it's kind of interesting because God doesn't want you to live that kind of life. How many more problems do we have to have before we come engaged ourselves? See, the world is passing away. We've seen that through the whole COVID thing. Yeah. Those who live solely for the things of this world, they're building sandcastles in the air. They will come to the end of their life with nothing of eternal value to show for all their efforts. The time is now for God's people to heed this message. Life is short. Life is precious. Seek first the kingdom of God. Stop sowing to the flesh and start sowing to the spirit. You know, one of my favorite movies, secular movies, is Shawshank Redemption. Mm. I don't know if you've ever seen the Shawshank Redemption. Not real good theology on some points, and I'm not advocating the movie. But I want to tell you something. One of my favorite lines from that movie is, get busy living or get busy dying. You only can do one of two things. If you sow to the flesh, you're busy dying. But if you sow to the Spirit, you're busy living. So my advice to you this evening is, get busy living, or you might as well just keep get busy dying. See, I'd like to repeat the two questions I asked at the beginning and ask you to ponder them again in light of the word that I shared with you this evening. I'm sure I was at work. The first question is this, what have you really been sowing? And the second question is an offshoot of that. Are you happy with what you've been reaping? Yep. Amen. See, if the answer to the second question is no, I have a third question for you tonight. For you tonight. What do you plan to do about it? Get married. Honestly, <laughs> what? Do you plan to do about it? Get down, get married, yeah. Think about this. This isn't a joke. No, no, no. I tell you again, you either get busy living or get busy dying. Let us bow our heads and pray. I'm sorry for going a little bit over tonight. We started a few minutes late. We got a little distraction. It's all good. Well, let us bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, so many of us, we've been spiritually sleepwalking through life. Yeah. Father, I know that so many people just go through the motions. They sow to the flesh. They, yeah. they fritter away every opportunity that's yeah. in their face, ignoring the needs of those who are so needy around us. Lord, teach us to count our days because all of us have a limited number of days to serve you as our Lord and Savior and to lift up this kingdom on this earth. Teach Amen. us, not only to number our days, but teach us to make sure that our, our days count, yes, that each day we have counts. Lord, this is a wake-up call, and I'm praying, Lord, that you wake us up, that you shake us up, that you do whatever it takes, Lord, to get our attention and help us to get busy living for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you all.